Okay, so we're going live now. Um, I don't see a lot of people in the room with us. <laughs> no, that's like the par for the course. If you get more than four people, you're like roaring success. Really? Yeah. It's good to be chatting with all of you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so so let's let's pause a second and start so we at least we get a good recording. We'll be here. Okay, welcome everybody. Um, COVID has killed almost six million people in the world, so it feels odd about talking about positive outcomes, um, about how technology is keeping the world working um, during the midst of a pandemic. But technology did play a pivotal role in supporting pandemic response protocols. Well, there are things that could have been done better. Um, generally, things went pretty well compared to other historic pandemics. So we managed our way through this one fairly well. Um, in our session today, we'll focus on how technology has been used as part of the COVID response and consider whether aspects of our new reality and our new way of doing things might change long-term business and personal cultures. With that, we'll go around the room and allow the panelists to introduce themselves um, as we go around, I'd like to ask each panelist to maybe think about uh, offering way in which technology has allowed us to cope with COVID and what how that technology might reshape the post-COVID response. Um, and let's start with Betty. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Betty Kumaho. I am the founder and managing partner of an advisory firm where we use design thinking, technology, and business performance improvement um, to help businesses grow. Um, we first got involved in an epidemic, which was Ebola in 2014, 2015. And we started um, a community of about 200 developers. We built over 40 technology applications um, around that um, epidemic. And one of the things that we realized was that um, this was not going to be the only time that it happened. We had been doing some work in Uganda and kind of understood that Ebola really sort of kept coming back and that a lot was going to be needed from a technology perspective to monitor and manage situations way before they became epidemics. And we realized that um, another epidemic would probably happen. And we anticipated that within five to 10 years, um, we would probably see a pandemic, which did happen um, in the form of COVID-19. So since then, um, we've been involved in a number of initiatives um, talking about technology and epidemics. Um, we are a member of Smith Futures Tech and COVID-19 um, Working Group um, and sit on that, really kind of focused on what element LMICs are doing around the fight. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here um, and to talk about all the ways that technology is needed um, in ensuring that there's information dissemination and ensuring that we can do the right testing um, and um, track um, whatever we need to around pandemics. Shrikar? Uh, yeah, good morning and glad to be here on the panel today. I'm Shrikar Reddy, CEO of Sonata Software Limited. We are a global tech services company headquartered in India, but with operations in most part of the world. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think obviously that, you know, too, too fast to the question, you know, in terms of how technology has helped us, uh, whether we want to call it cope, cope or live or come through COVID fairly well. I think, I think the first part has been really with the whole, I, I guess the medical technology, I think, uh, which has uh, which has really uh, helped the world to come up uh, with the vaccines and and deliver it to most 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 parts of the world fairly effectively and you know track the uh, you know disease and apps and you know all that kind of stuff. I think uh, without I think advances uh, and collaboration and you know, all the kind of things which happened in medical technology, we wouldn't have come through this. Uh, as well as uh, I guess we have done. 
and obviously i think uh, all the other digital technologies which have uh, really helped us including you know getting onto a platform like this uh, would, uh, you know wouldn't have been possible uh, but for the advancement in in in, in technologies collaboration applications uh, ability for pe people to work uh, work remotely uh, able to deliver services i think uh, a whole lot of other you know stuff to you know deliver food services groceries whatever it is i think all that really helped us uh, you know uh, with for us to live through this to two two and a half years uh, obviously it's created its own uh, challenges in terms of what is called the digital divide uh, especially i'm i'm sh sure it's got a bigger a bigger play in countries like india where you know a whole whole percentage of population uh, uh, couldn't get access in the last 3 years uh, to i think something as basic as education so i think there is a lot of i think uh, things which need to be done to ensure that in in in, in future uh, uh, you know there is a more equalized way to get access uh, to these uh, technological advancements so there's a lot more which needs to be done including i'm sure i think some of these vaccines etc i think still there is a fairly unequal distribution of the availability uh, in 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 the whole uh, whole world uh, talent is becoming a big big this thing as the demand for modernization and technology deployments are uh, becoming and there's a more a huge bigger pressure uh, i think how do we get talent to address the growing needs uh, is becoming a challenge uh, companies have to i guess uh, figure out uh, more innovative models to uh, you know deliver services uh, so that's i guess uh, my initial opening statement okay go ahead hello everyone uh, nice to meet you my name is uh, kohei from japan and i'm quite honored to be invited to the horses conference this moment uh, I'm a co-founder of the Privacy by Design Lab. We established uh, organizations uh, two years ago. Since we are seen in the new uh, initiative of the uh, providing the privacy by design into the concept of the older companies to create something, the physical products and digital services, where we are seeing the lot of technology is needed more data. Um, but the, in the COVID-19, we become sensitive to provide the data to, to many, many authorities at this moment because of the, some of the vulnerabilities of the data. That is uh, very important to be selective for the users who should be trusted party to provide it, to getting the returns uh, to prevent end of the COVID as well as to uh, take a flourish the life. So we... Uh, aims to uh, collaborate with the global institutions to support to make a global standards or framework uh, for the privacy. Privacy is not against to use the personal data because the data is the essence to create the future societies. We have to use the data to empower the individual the societies to become a more um, future societies. So we should collaborate with the global talented global people to encourage the local organizations to create something new values with the data. So our mission is uh, try to boost this movement uh, with the global talented. Under the COVID, we see the many products to collect the personal data. For example, the vaccine passport, uh, which is now uh, being used a lot, but in the future we need for the global travel to make the most moves. Uh, like this uh, product, we need a privacy forest. So uh, I'm happy to take an idea with them. So thank you, that's my message. Okay, Mohit. Yes, thank you. Well, again, uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, look, I think, uh, the points have been made by the other speakers as well. Uh, from my perspective, the most amazing thing is that we are now two and a half years into the pandemic. And if you told me in January 2020 uh, that we were going to have a globally synchronized 
two year lockdown, uh, I really wouldn't have worried so much about things like, are we able to impart culture to new colleagues who join us? And, uh, you know, is there a, a concern about uh, Zoom fatigue of people working from home? I'd have been worried about whether we could get food and energy and basic supplies uh, to the world, right? Because clearly we have lived through a revolutionary period in human history. And the fact that we have uh, survived, I think is a huge testament to uh, how technology has played such a key role in uh, allowing us to, you know, to function as a, you know, as a species and as a society. I don't think that we could have done this uh, back in 89 or 1990 uh, if we'd had the same pandemic. Now, admittedly, because global travel was limited as well, maybe the pandemic wouldn't have spread as fast. But if you had travel without, uh, you know, essentially the internet, I think most societies would have struggled to, you know, to survive. And the challenges we've had would have been, you know, far, far higher. Now, uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, in terms of the impact of the pandemic on technologies, I think uh, on technologies and on the world, I feel that it's given a fillip to already existing trends. Uh, so, you know, for instance, uh, you know, uh, uh, Kohei spoke about data. I think, you know, the use of data from a machine learning perspective uh, to create algorithms was a pre-existing trend that we're seeing being magnified now because there is so much more data available. Uh, the focus on the cloud, for instance, right? I think uh, the pandemic has driven some of the largest companies and also individuals to store their data on the cloud uh, just because of, you know, cost and because of accessibility. Uh, we're seeing a huge focus on cybersecurity because so much of the world now is uh, digital. Uh, we're seeing a huge focus uh, on experience, uh, you know, on digital experience, right? On customer experience, when they buy something, when employee experience. So I feel that uh, these are trends that will continue into the future. Uh, but the centrality of technology in allowing us to function as a species, I think, is something that we've pretty much taken for granted. I think if we cast our minds back to Jan 2020, the outcome was not so obvious, right? The outcome that we have today, where we're all, uh, you know, the world is still in a semi lockdown situation. Uh, but the fact that we can continue to have a you know global dialogue, uh, I think, is all thanks to uh, the advances that we've seen over the past two decades in technology. Okay. Gary, thank you. Uh, I head the Consumer Technology Association. It's a group of 1,500 American technology companies, and we own and produce the CES, which is the world's largest innovation and technology event. Uh, we had it in January in the midst of the. Uh, um, Omicron virus, uh, where a million people a day were being tested positive in the United States. And, but we still attracted 14,000 people from around the world outside the United States coming, uh, 14,000 plus the 40,000 in, in the U.S. Uh, we had a, what we saw there was an incredible amount of innovation. I, I think the arc of technology has changed slightly because of COVID. I mean, our ability to have just this discussion here in the comfort of our own homes is something which is just didn't happen three or four years ago. And what we also saw, at least in the United States, was a major shift in healthcare providing. Not only do we have a shortage of doctors um, and healthcare professionals, but we shifted to telehealth rapidly. Uh, before the pandemic, only about one out of 10 Americans had ever done it, and now it's about half. And a lot of that also, there's been a dramatic impact on mental health, especially. I mean, in, in a sense, it's, it's good because it um, is very green. You could meet with people as we are without uh, traveling. Uh, but on the other hand, we've also, I think, the learning I've taken away through all these great technologies, and we've had, we had more innovation we've ever had at CES by far. Um, we also recognize that as human beings, we need each other. We need the face-to-face -face live five sense experience. And uh, as a CEO, that's been something that's um, been very difficult as I talk with other CEOs of Big, small companies, they feel very uh, disconnected. Uh, one of the panelists mentioned earlier, onboarding, um, just bringing people up to speed. And we've also, I think, at least, again, I, I'm not going to talk about the rest of the world because I don't know it. Uh, the schooling, a lot of kids by staying home from school and by people wearing masks all the time has definitely impacted the ability of our children over the last two years to get vital signals from people and deal with other people and they're kind of stuck in their technology a lot, and, and we, we still haven't figured out that. So it's definitely been a mixed bag um, in many ways, but I think we've, we've definitely changed who we are as humans because of it and how we deal with technology. 
Cool. And I'm Jerry Power. I'm CEO of i3 Systems. Um, we're a startup. Um, we actually were formed just at the beginning of the pandemic, which is makes it kind of interesting time to, to form a company. Um, what we do is we build um, data fabrics that tie together independent organizations so that they can collaborate based on data, um, which is kind of a, an interesting and different way. Um, I, th I think from my experience, from my perspective, when we started the company, um, we immediately decided we were going to become a virtual company and that we wanted to be able to attract um, and interact with people regardless of where they were ge geographically. So we have um, a mailing address, but that's really all it is, is just a mailing address and people are spread all around the world. Um, and that's kind of how we want to approach and sort of grow the company. Um, I, th I think the pandemic, there was always technology that let people do things um, that, that we're doing today. Um, so the pandemic, I don't think really introduced a lot of new technology as much as it sort of totally re-altered the way we prioritize things. So some technologies which were kind of uh, intellectual curiosities have suddenly gone to becoming critical functions um, and, and even business processes, the way we think about the way we interact with employees, with customers. Uh, I mean, things that had been really on a slow boat, let's sort of take our time and figure this out, became high priority issues that were a matter of life or death for um, individuals or for companies. Um, and I think that's really what, what COVID brought along. Um, and I think with that, with that, that change, and I think Gary sort of talked about this a little bit, but that change, I think some of those changes will be with us, um, and I'll say forever, um, because they are things that we were slowly moving toward, but now we sort of, by circumstance, have been forced to embrace them and pull them closer. Um, so I think that's how we sort of look at things, um, which is, is kind of interesting. Um, so for the most part, we, we did adopt um, pre-COVID. We changed priorities. It changed the world. Um, I'd, I'd like to sort of think a little bit about, about as we go through a recovery period um, and things start to ebb, um, whether you guys see like we do, like things staying the same or whether you think we'll sort of go back to some pre-COVID behaviors um, and it, so kind of the, the mindset of what we would think about in a, in a world that is recovering, how we think some of these technologies will um, remain on the front of our um, priority list. I know, Betty, you had some, some, some ideas on this space. Yeah, I mean, for, from my perspective, um, we certainly have moved very quickly in certain areas working from home, collaboration is just one example. Um, I don't think that we can go back <laughs> to where we were pre-COVID. Um, whether we will stay here, I, I also don't think that's the case. Um, so for me, what I really think about is the opportunity that I don't think we've capitalized on yet. I think uh, Gary alluded to this a little bit as well, is that we realized through the pandemic that we are really social beings. We really do need one another. We need that human touch. We need that um, in-person kind of communication. We need to be able to read emotional cues and, and faces. And it's not quite the same. Um, even though this is a great screen and great resolution and great connection, it's not quite the same being in person and, and interacting in, in person. And so I think that from a technology perspective, we really have an opportunity to rethink um, some of the ways that we enable business processes as well as enable human interaction um, and figure out what we can do a little differently. I think the pandemic was a crisis and we used what we had at the time to kind of get through it, which is great. But I think that now we also have a little bit of a breather. I don't think this is the last pandemic. I think there will be another one. And I think the question is, um, or another global crisis as we're already sort of, um, well, we're starting to see a regional crisis now. So I, the, the question I think for, uh, for me is how do we as technologists figure out how to make technology more human, um, a more human enablement um, kind of uh, factor? Okay, any other thoughts? I, I certainly think about about yeah making it more human. 
Um, but I think I also think that one of the things COVID has taught us um, is that the world is much more dynamic um, than it. And, and I don't know to say that it had been, but we've sort of begin to embrace the need to be in and live in a dynamic environment. So yeah, COVID sort of changed everything. Um, there are recent global events that are sort of changing everything again. Um, but I think as a whole, we look forward, as, as Betty said, and there's going to be another thing that comes up on the horizon that sort of changes things again. Um, whereas I think historically we sort of focused on um, trying to build toward a stable future. I think we have to embrace the fact that the world is becoming increasingly dynamic. Um, and, and that changes a lot. Um, I don't know if um, you guys are seeing that for the ones that are doing consulting, whether you're seeing that with your customers or, or not. Um, yeah, I think the, uh, the word in 2020 was unprecedented and the word in 2022 is uncertain. Uh, I think people are not clear on the future. It makes them uncomfortable. It's effective um, investment. When you use the word dynamic, that was a polite way of saying uh, less unstable, <laughs> less yeah. stable. I think there's a feeling that things are spinning out of control. Um, you know, one of the things that we're facing in the United States is a impact on workforce where a lot of people just dropped out um, and no one's quite figured out why it's either mental health or it's child care, uh, kids not in school, or it's just that people or marijuana legalization, you know, or the government's been very generous giving people money. So maybe it's multifactorial in the sense that people just, the, every employer now has the number one issue is finding employees. Um, and that, that's a big deal. And that, and now we're dealing with the, you know, inflation we haven't seen in, in two generations. It's a, it's a, it's a world with, with, which is less clear. And you, you know, you top off Ukraine on top of that, which feels threatening to many people. And for the first time in our lifetimes, almost someone seriously talking about nuclear warfare as a threat, um, a real immediate threat. And that's something which, uh, I, I think it's really affected people's mental health. And, and I know this is in other, um, Western countries as well, talking to some of my colleagues, this is a big issue, but technology does provide some, AIDS, but a technology is only a tool. It's not a, it's not a total solution. And, and, the, and we have to come up with better ways of dealing with each other as humans uh, and get back to some of the live interactions we've had. Um, but, but in terms of what we could do from a healthcare point of view, that to me is the most exciting. Um, you know, when we talk about getting clean air, clean water, healthcare, things like that, so people live safer and healthier lives, I think technology provides phenomenal answers. And that, that will continue to help. Yeah, so, so one of the things that I, I sort of been watching and paying attention to is sort of problems that the pandemic uh, introduced in supply chain. I mean, pre-pandemic, um, the goal of, of people who work in supply chain was to remove any inefficiency in the process, which, you know, just in time and all those kind of ideas where um, stuff shows up exactly the moment it's needed. Um, so you you move to eliminate any slack in the process. But in doing so, by making yourself so e efficient, if one of those chains breaks, it disrupts the whole process completely. And I, and I think in supply chain, we're seeing a movement now almost a, a, away from, I'm going to say, optimal efficiency to providing optimal service that is able to recover in the in the focus of disruption. I think that same question can be applied to um, human labor, um, the people who work for companies. I mean, if something happens in a country, a spot, if an office gets uh, the pandemic, if there's some other crisis, you have to have some way to pull in additional people from outside. Uh, I think that's probably a good thing for people who are in the consulting business. Um, but I think it also changes the mindset as you're sort of putting a strategic plan together and sort of starting to move forward. Are, are you guys are you guys seeing like um, labor issues um, associated with the pandemic or? Yeah, I think look, uh, there are a couple of things over here. One is that uh, the market for talent is super heated just now, right? And this is especially true in certain areas, so certain uh, business domains like technology. Uh, or even, uh, you know, banking uh, and in certain geographies. So certainly in the U.S., I think in India, 
there are very severe talent shortages in technology. Uh, I also feel that, uh, you know, that there's also been almost a permanent change in the work-life balance for many people. Uh, many people have, you know, sort of gotten out work early. Many people want to drop off the treadmill. Uh, the expectations of, uh, you know, an 80 to 100 hour work week are not there anymore. So, uh, coupled the, with, you know, the reality of an aging sort of global population, especially in the Western world, will mean that we will be living with these uh, labor shortages, I think, for a very long time. Uh, but again, I think the, the solution will have to come from technology. It will be greater automation. Uh, it will be greater use of uh, robotics and AI, uh, which will help us deal with these challenges uh, of aging uh, workforce and of a reduction in actual, uh, you know, in the number of uh, active workers. Good observation. As, as we start moving into that environment where um, we're able to shift and pull on workers or move work around, I mean, it's almost like the modularization of, of work. Um, it certainly is driving increased interest and focus on things like um, privacy. Um, so that's certainly there. Um, but I think it's wrong to sort of assume the word privacy means what it meant before the pandemic. I mean, that even even privacy has to be managed um, much more dynamically because, I mean, how do you bring on a new team, get rapidly get into a trusted situation with them um, so that you're exchanging data and sort of moving ahead with the process despite the obstacles that have been placed in front of you? Um, I, what do you guys think about, about privacy as an issue that's sort of tied to all of this? Yeah, I'm uh, working on this part and... Since the privacy is a little bit very complex is because the people is feeling the privacy, it's a kind of the human rights. But it's, it's, it's not just for the human rights at this moment because the protection should be on the security as well. It's in, uh, uh, like the big moving uh, in the international region in some place. It is a very hard to predict the best practice uh, to protect the your data. Of course, uh, we should protect our own human rights, but we should uh, take consider how we can use the data or use the technologies uh, for the benefit, the returns for us. So it's a time to uh, start from the risk assessment. That is the uh, like the, my practice when I'm working in this area because the risk has always been existing. Uh, even though you are uh, working on the new technology every time, in the pandemic, I think it's becoming more serious uh, for the risk of the technology. We should consider what is the risk, what we can abolish this risk by using other technology. So that, that's a kind of a similar concept. The Gary is called it, it's a technology a tool. Tools has the, some of the, uh, the bad aspects. We should uh, mitigate the, the risk to use even the data, the technology at this moment right now. Good. Good. Um, one of the things, and, and um, I, I'm thinking about, you know, the software has been the software market has been moving into this modularized architecture, where basically you can switch in and out modules. You start thinking about software not as um, a Goliath problem, but really a bunch of small problems that have to be assembled together. Um, uh, Sirkar, I mean, I don't know whether you've seen in, in the software space some of the software concepts sort of being applied in the human space, but I think that's an interesting thing to think about. Okay, sorry. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, I think it's very clear that with the continuous change uh, of business process, customer needs, organizations to be needing to be more agile in the way they adapt technology to changing business needs has dramatically altered. So as you said, the age of the Goliath or, or dinosaur single solution to all problems is gone. And whether you call it microservices architecture or service oriented architecture or whatever one may want to call it, those companies who have actually broken up their systems into little managed parts are, are, are becoming a lot more nimble and agile to deal with changing needs to people who have this big stuff 
and I, I, I meet a lot of clients and, you know, there are people who say, you know, my business came and told me I need to do this in one week's time. And these people tell them no, to change our technology, it will take six months time or something along those lines, because the underlying technology architectures are not agile or open or scalable or whatever other definitions one may want to have. So, so absolutely, I think that the world changes and enterprises or businesses, governments, whoever they are, want to become more nimble, agile and serve better, faster, etc. I think uh, software as uh, a monolith, uh, the concept, I mean, it's been going on for a long time, but it needs to obviously speed up and will speed up, uh, I think, dramatically as we go forward. It's I've, I'm personally like I was in a meeting last week um, with some people who were presented with a problem and they sort of took this top down approach um, thinking about, well, let's talk about the user experience we want to achieve and then build things underneath it to solve that problem. Um, and they were clearly headed toward this monolithic. Um, here's one application that provides all these different experiences and features. Um, and, and I want to compare that or contrast that there was a report that Accenture issued yesterday that talked about this this idea of being driven that way leads to um, a lot of inefficiencies because as you have other problems you're trying to solve it's very difficult to reuse across um, from prior projects and they were sort of advocating that there needs to be a much more platform driven approach to the way we think about technology and what we're doing um, which I, I find kind of interesting because it's almost like arguing two different sides of a coin. And maybe the right answer is that we have to sort of split ourselves between the two and think about things as a platform um, on one side. But at the same time, then we have to think about how do we use platforms to provide the experiences that we're trying to evolve for. Uh, I think this is just a, an ongoing debate that I expect we'll see more of um, coming forward. The, the other thing I, I, I sort of think about, um, we, we used to, and I'm, I'm rolling back a little bit in, in years, but we used to think about there's a consumer market and there's a business market. There are devices for consumers, there are devices for businesses. Um, and what I think we're all saying is that that clear line of demarcation between those two different markets is beginning to disappear. Um, it, because people are working at home. So, I mean, you're using the same devices for both work and for personal. That impacts the devices people buy, which is kind of in Gary's, uh, one of Gary's points. It, it impacts privacy. It impacts the way we teach people about using technology and organizational structures. And it, it impacts the way we think about software um, and strategy. Um, so I wonder whether, whether anybody else sort of is focused or thinking in that direction as well. Well, there's no question that we've definitely shifted from the world where the CIO and the IT department controlled the uh, acquisitions by their people to it's people are, are they're choosing what they want to use. And, you know, it may, it, it may depend who's paying for it. Uh, just to go back historically, there used to be an event called Comdex, and that was based on the top down, uh, top down. And now it doesn't exist. And we're the bottom up consumer technology event. Uh, so we've definitely uh, the, the marketplace has shown that. But I also think in terms of, since back to the subject of what COVID has done, I mean, COVID's accelerated a digital transformation. I used to stand up 15 years ago and t said that every company is a technology company. They just don't realize it yet. And, and now, you know, the Fortune 500 companies, according to at least the surveys done, they all consider themselves technology companies. We see companies from major agriculture companies like John Deere, to, you know, obviously all the software platforms, but to others that are participating with us and our members, um, insurance companies, healthcare companies, other companies, they're all trying to figure out how to use technology and marry technology with things. One of the, the things that has occurred, whether or not because of COVID, is that the skill sets that are needed to lead organizations has fundamentally changed. So that instead of being an expert in one vertical area, you have to be able to work across different vertical disciplines that are, that are not only by, uh, product category or service category, whether it's transportation, content creation, healthcare, but also in a sense, culturally. So the value of an MBA actually, for those that I used to wonder about why people got MBAs, 
I think to the extent it focuses on cross-cultural differences, teamwork's solution. I mean, what, in, what innovation is really about is, about is it about creating, you know, disparate ideas and putting them together to create something new that has value. And that's why, uh, in a sense, COVID has hurt us because we have less serendipity, we have less discovery, we meet fewer people. We're kind of stuck in this, you know, this relationshipless world of Zoom where we just exchange some information and move on without any real human Humanity is part of it, and now we've we're losing a lot, and that's in the creative world, especially. That's become an issue. So um, the devices that people use, I mean, what's what really changed the world was the smartphone because it had so many uh, sensing devices in there that were so cheap uh, because they're produced in the hundreds of millions, and they're just being used in very clever ways now. Whether it's the Internet of Things or you know. Uh, artificial intelligence now with, uh, you know, connecting those things and figuring out what works and what doesn't. I mean, it, it, this is still the very beginning of a phenomenal revolution in technology in terms of how easy the devices themselves. I mean, the issues we're, we're pushing up against are um, availability of energy, for example, which is, you know, it's a war is being fought over that now. Uh, and also, though, it's not it's availability of talent. Um, and uh, and then there's things like privacy, which I'm glad to hear about, because there's trade offs in privacy that occur between what the purpose is. I mean, I, I have to say we could have done a better job with COVID and going forward. And, and we, we found a barrier of privacy and some of the countries managed to, to go up against it, but we don't have the level of analysis and data we should have at this stage in human evolution to deal with COVID. I mean, there's still debates, uncertainty as to what really works, whether masks are needed, whether they're not, um, how COVID is actually even spread is still relatively unknown. I mean, we know it's airborne, but we really don't know much about it. Um, and it, it's, we, we, we could do better. And we actually prepared a document preparing technology for the next, um, the next uh, pandemic. Because as I think Betty said, there'll be another one, there'll be something else. We're always going to deal with crises. And it's a question of how we deal with them as humans. Other thoughts? It, I, I find it interesting that, I mean, this is a session on technology, but it seems like all of us are sort of echoing the view that it's not, I mean, technology is not a limiting factor. I mean, we've, we've gone from a, a time when what you could do or couldn't do was determined by technology, but now it's really, it, it's a people kind of issue. It's how can technology enable people to do what they want to do? How do we get people to come along on the process? Um, but we're really sort of describing technology as a very people-centric kind of issue. Yeah, I, I, I want to say that the, the human-centric is the kind of the concept. The human has the powers to control the technology. That could be the very important uh, in the analysis of our countries, then uh, 76% of the consumer is um, preference to take in the privacy than expected to the company to make it themselves. And uh, this is the factors to choose the brand, the technologies uh, from the consumer perspective. They want to be willingness to get a relationship with the uh, company to provide the more trusted products. Uh, I think the trusted concept is becoming a different from the old fashions. Nowadays, especially the young people, is becoming sensitive to share their own contents. Of course, the, some of the young people is the, uh, sharing their own social media and Twitter, the TikTok, the, a lot of the new social media, we see it. But the problem is that they are trying to become sensitive, to be selective, to disclose and to conceal their the data. So I think that the technical perspective, the company is trying to take in a great relationship with the customers. That is the very essence. I think the privacy one perspective, the other perspective, the returns for the customers. So we should have taken a balance to, uh, to keep them accountable for all the consumers. That is the future trend of the technology uh, for my legions. So yeah, one thing, so. That, oh, go ahead. No, I think the only point I was making is uh, look, I think. Uh, you know, user experience has become very important. Uh, this includes employee experience as well. Clearly, pre-pandemic, uh, you know, and you saw this most often in, you know, contact center type situations, right, where employees had to log into multiple systems to get the answer for, uh, you know, for clients. And clearly, when people are working from home, that was feasible. We've seen very significant investments going into uh, empowering the employees 
to get the data that they need and also empowering the users to do self-service in a world where operations costs are rising and technology costs are falling uh, that's the only solution uh, but people will you know will choose the option to go online and not pick up the phone if you just make it easy for them to you know to transact uh, virtually so I'm I'm drawn to think about about Darwin and the theory of evolution. I mean, Darwin was pretty clear that evolution's not a steady state kind of process. But it's there are periods when evolution happens quickly, and then there are periods where things stay stable for a long time. Um, and I sort of think that um, pandemic-wise, we've been put in a place where um, things are evolving fast, faster than they have been before. Um, and uh, just like in evolution, where different species sort of come out on top at the end of those periods, um, I think that there are opportunities um, that the pandemic is presenting us with. Um, I think there's opportunities for um, companies to sort of usurp the, the small guys to usurp the big guys. Um, but I also think even at, a, at an international level, I think there are opportunities for countries um, that are, have been sort of followers to sort of step in and become leaders. Um, so I think this is, we, if we think about the pandemic as, as a change, it's really also an, an opportunity. Um, and I'm kind of wondering whether you guys see that as well um, and whether you see people sort of starting to try and move and take advantage of the unprecedented times we find ourselves in. I, I think that we can take more opportunity. Um, and I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity. I keep thinking, you mentioned Darwin, but I keep thinking about Conway's law, which I think in its simplest forms is if you're building software in an organization that has four departments, you'll end up pretty much with four compo components of your software. Um, but I think what Murphy's law really kind of talked about is that even the way we learn about technology um, and even the way we adapt technology itself has to change and there has to be a process around that. Um, we talked about, I, I think Gary mentioned it as well, that, um, and I agree with that, that technology itself is not an industry. I always say it'll, it'll, nobody will talk about it as an industry. It's an enabler. It's a tool. It's part of us. It is, should be part of us. It should be part of our daily thinking. It should be part of the way we structure things, the way we change things. We have to make it that way a bit more. And I think that what the pandemic has taught us is that technology is great at speeding things up and automation, but really, how do we make it more human? How do we think about, okay, with every time that we're thinking about a technology change, we should have diversity in the group of people who are thinking about it, who have we not thought about kind of what their needs would be or how they would use it or how they would interface with it? Are, are we really kind of at every step of the process optimizing how human we are with the very processes that are going to use the technology. And that's a huge opportunity that I'm not seeing a lot being absorbed in. All right, we're coming up on the end of our session. So let me put, let me put the screen up for anybody who's um, joined us or anybody who's watching the video afterwards so that they can find us and if they want to continue the conversation, reach out to us. Um, but while the screen's up and people are, are writing down email addresses, um, does anybody have any closing thoughts they want to share uh, as we go out of the session? But really, no, I mean, glad to have been part of the session and uh, thank you all very much. I think uh, was very interactive. Thanks, Jerry, for for taking all the pain to uh, do the uh, pre-work and running in a great way. Uh, glad to have been part of this. I second that. Thank you, Jerry. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank all right. you. Thank all. you. Thank you. All. Great discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm.